All right, can I have everybody's attention? We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming out today. We have two incredible speakers for you. Uh, we have two hours planned. However, these speakers have been gracious enough to offer their time for questions and answers and anything you have and how much time and how long you think it will take. So I'm not going to hold you long. Uh, so this is a team event, and we're going to let our teams run it. So I'm going to turn it over to Riley, who's going to do the first introduction. Philip Wilkerson III um, has nearly 10 years of experience in higher education, including financial aid and admissions, in addition to career counseling. Mr. Wilkers Mr. Wilkerson attended James Madison University and graduated with a, with a Bachelor of Arts in History, while in graduate school obtaining his Master's in Education with a concentration in counseling from George Mason University. Mr. Wilkerson took a career counseling course it was there that he fell in love with professional development and self-discovery to one's own professional path. To further strengthen his passion for career counseling, Mr. Wilkerson conducted an internship at George Mason Career Services. Currently, he is an employer engagement consultant at George Mason University Career Services. He oversees all industries that fall under the creative industries umbrella. Examples of this at Mason include media, performing in visual arts, entertainment, journal journalism, public relations, and graphic design. The role serves both student and employer stakeholders, meaning Philip both collaborates with employers to make them aware of the talented students at Mason through invita invitations to visit campus for fairs, workshops, and unique events, and meets with students to market their creative skills through professional branding, which are like resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn profiles, Mr. Wilkerson will be speaking to us today on the topic of kind leadership. Please save all questions until the end of this presentation. Mr. Wilkerson. Thank you. All right. And also, I didn't, I didn't put it in the bio. I'm also a Jack and Jill alum. I didn't realize my mom was bringing me to all those events. I was annoyed. Did the botillion with a little hat. But now, being on the other side, I see the value. I was like, wow, my mom really set me ahead. So. Really thank your moms for getting you involved. If you won't do it today, you'll probably be washed in 38 like me, and then you'll thank your mom uh, for doing it. Which chapter? Uh, the, the Woodbridge chapter. So yes, the Woodbridge chapter. So um, today's presentation is a kind leader is a strong leader. And so I always start off uh, thinking about what we're going to talk about today, a little bit about what is kindness, the types of, of leadership there is, uh, what uh, it means to be li uh, kind, the myths, dispel the myths around kindness, uh, the characteristics of a kind leader. And we're going to have some activities. After the questions, we'll have some activities because I want you to actually practice and exhibit this yourselves. So we're going to do a quick video, just a little snapshot. I wonder if the audio will work. If it doesn't, okay, forget it. We're not going to do the video. But just understand in that video, I'm just going to do the, the bullet points, that kindness is going beyond uh, just the mushy, woo-woo, huggy-huggy. Kindness, actually, if you think about it in the sense of anything, whether being a member of a team or being a leader, this actually increases productivity. It actually makes you feel like you belong in an environment. It actually is uh, connected to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So kindness goes beyond just the emotional response of being nice to someone, right? Think about all the times someone complimented you on something that you did well. What was the likelihood? What did you do? Think about this. What did you do when someone complimented you on something that you did well? Just reflect on it. Assuming, when you think about that, did you do that same action again, right? So kindness does reinforce positive behavior. Kindness reinforces strengths. Kindness reinforces a positive leader to supervision, supervisee relationship. Now, if you see on this picture right here, I have three different graphics, right? Uh, on the, I guess, is that the left, right? I'm always never getting that right. I have to do like the L, whatever. When they say turn, whatever, I go the wrong way. But on that side, you see the handsome gentleman uh, with the high top fade putting medals on another handsome gentleman. That is Philip Linwood Wilkerson Jr., my father, right? And so when I was growing up, 
my image of a leader was like my father, right? He was 30 years in the Army, retired colonel. Uh, he told us a different path, a member of Omega Sci Fi. We'll, we'll, let him, we'll let him slide on that. But with that being said, when I saw a leader and looking at my father, I thought it was very authoritarian, right? Do as I say, not as I do, right? No questions. Uh, I made my bed. I still make my bed every day, right? And so in my mindset, when I thought of a leader and when I was growing up, I thought it was someone that would walk in and command a room and everyone would stand at attention and be dead silent. That was the image of leadership to me shaped by my father, right? Then on the other end is my grandfather, Dr. Charles James. And so if you think about it, you say, wow, Dr. Charles James, it was quite remarkable. He uh, attended McHenry uh, Medical School in 1956. So think about the time of getting a doctor, uh, becoming an MD in 1956. He served the greater community of Charlotte, North Carolina, segregated South, where he only saw black patients because even though he was highly intelligent and smart, white doctors did not believe that he was qualified to serve them, right? He, had, he was a father of seven kids, and when patients could not pay him with money, they paid him with food. So think about a guy that has seven kids, and he's doing his thing for the community, not getting payment, but he's still doing it anyway. Um, he was charismatic, he was funny, He'd always take pictures, when we took pictures, he'd always say, let me get in with the ladies, they make me look good. Another different path, you know, a member of Kappa Alpha Psi, I'm like, dang, all these different. So when I looked at my grandfather, I thought that a leader was someone that was super intelligent, someone that had high academic status, someone that had prestige, right? And so where did I fit in? As I was growing up, I was like, I had no desire to join the military, I had no desire to be a doctor, Therefore, I'm not on track to be a leader like these two people that are examples. But as I've grown older and as I've gone through life and gone through college and got involved in activities, I realize that leadership does not take one form and leadership is not one style, right? And so we're gonna go over that and embed that regardless of my father, my grandfather, my father, kindness to, kindness to, was still embedded in their leadership style, right? So we're gonna talk about even with a very authoritarian leader, there's kindness, and very, with a charismatic, super intelligent community leader, there's kindness. So the types of leadership, and we're just gonna go through and I'm gonna give examples. You know, here's some graphics to help you illustrate those examples. But right here, there's many different types of leadership. Uh, in the study of leadership, you know, the actual discipline, people that are studying it, there's over thousands of different theories and leadership theories, right? There's ones called authentic leadership, positive leadership, strengths-based leadership. Everyone is developing theories. And so are they all right or wrong? No. As we develop and curate these things, we're just learning that people think of different and leadership in different aspects, different roles, different communities, and different styles. So this is just an example. These that I listed right here are not the only styles of leadership in existence, but just a way to help you think about the different types, right? So bureaucratic, right? Bureaucratic mean, bureaucracy means there's a very hierarchical, very, we call this more like the parental, right? And you'll see that relationship with bureaucratic Right? If you're walking across the street as a child and your mom says, hold my hand, no questions, you do it, right? Because in the bureaucratic style, it's about safety, innate safety. Right? You are not at the level to respond back to me and give me any challenges because in a bureaucratic system, I know what's best for you. So does that work everywhere? Absolutely not. But in certain situations where there's immediate danger, where the person just needs to go into action and just listen to what's being told to them, the bureaucratic style of leadership works, right? And that's why we have the picture of the parent holding the child's hand, right? Like, don't touch the stove. Very just, you don't need to ask why in those situations, right? Authoritative, that is similar to bureaucratic because you'll see as this goes on that this is very similar uh, because it's very close to doing what I said and not what I, but it's very hierarchical. When you think of authoritative, that's really what it is, the military. That's my father. That's the do as I say, 
I will give you a little bit of explanation, but at the end of the day, you're still gonna do it, right? Uh, uh, and, and that leadership style does align and does work in certain situations. For the military, it works because if you're in a dangerous situation, you do not have time to argue back, right? You listen to orders, you do it, right? Um, and so similarly, there's, there's spaces and environments where this actually works. Innovative. How many people have heard of the word thought leadership? Thought leaders, right? And what that means is like you just got good ideas, people follow you, right? That's kind of what innovative is, right? It means that you're a leader in thought and theory, uh, but you still surround yourself with other people. Most people that are thought leaders, kind of like, uh, for the example there, would be someone like Steve Jobs or something like that, where they are the leader, they had the ideas, they had the thoughts, but they're gathering ideas from people that they trust, they're sharing their ideas. It's more, um, when I say reciprocal, they're listening to the world and gathering feedback, uh, but it's very creative, right? So thought leadership, innovative, right? You have new ideas and you like to share and persuade people with your new ideas, right? These new creative ideas, you just have to be very persuasive, right? Pacing. So that's the track. And we got any athletes here, anyone that runs track? or any athletes, period. So basically think about this. This style pace setting is that coach that is telling you and running you through drills, right? So how many times for the track, do we, we got any track athletes here? Some? Okay, I used to be washed, you know, when I was like 150 pounds and I was crushing it in 400, asked me to do 400 now, I'd probably pass out, you had to call emergency on me, but um, <laughs> When I was running, pace setting means they set benchmarks, they keep you going, but they set the pace, meaning, you know, your track coach, when you're doing your, um, your what's it called, repeats, your 400 repeats, right? When you run around the lap, they time you and say, okay, you hit 400, you know, you, you hit uh, 50 seconds. I was trying to think of something really good, you know. You're know, saying 45 seconds, that's like Michael Johnson, you know, that's Olympics, right? But you hit 50, 50 seconds, right? All right, next lap, I want you to do it again. I understand that the pace is gonna be a little bit slower, you're gonna hit 55. And so they're working you, but they're, they're doing it in a way that they're not gonna burn you out, all right? So pace, they set the pace. Uh, in other ways or other examples, this is what someone would say is a project manager, where they see the overall benchmarks of things and they keep the team together. They keep the team saying, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna get there, but they set benchmarks and they adjust, right? They know, okay, you know, we might have to set this deadline a little bit further. We have to set a different pace because that's, that's what a pace setting leader is. Um, democratic, I reclaim my time. This means you are a leader of the people in a democracy, meaning that you are the voice, but you're elected by the people. And there's a lot of, basically any role where you say the word, you know, president, anything where you're elected, that is a democratic leadership, meaning you're serving as the voice of a bigger body than yourself. You are a leader, but you are elected by the people, right? So that's the democratic. Um, Affiliative is very similar. It means affili uh, uh, affiliation. You're a, you're a leader by affiliation, so it does intersect. We see my brother of Alpha Phi Alpha. That's a affiliative leader style. We are leaders within an organization, right? Our leadership is attached to something else. It's affiliated with. Coaching, I'm going to share a quick story. Coaching, same thing, means uh, coaching is when you're a leader that you're not actually doing it, so they're very similar to pay setting but you had the experience to teach other people how to do it, right? You, you develop other people. And so, you know, we already know Dean Smith, and you didn't know that was Dean Smith. He's not playing basketball, but he's coaching. He's developing other people. That's that type of leadership. One of my favorite stories about Dean Smith was that when he died, well, before he was dying, he put a lot of money aside in a fund, like just a fund that grew money, right? And when he died, uh, he had in his will that every player that played for him at UNC received $200 and a note, regardless if you were a letter athlete, whether you were Michael Jordan, a billionaire, or you were that walk-on, you received a letter that said, thank you so much for allowing me to coach you, take your family out to something nice to eat for dinner, love Dean Smith. And so that development, right, he thought in that coaching mindset that coaching is developing other leaders, but his mindset was, I don't wanna just develop you as a leader for the basketball court, I wanna develop you and coach you to be leaders as men. So that's, that was just really cool. And then lastly, altruistic. Altruistic, does anyone know what the word altruism means? Altruism, fancy word, you know, probably write that down, I don't know if it'll be on the SAT. Altruism comes from 
uh, the sense that you feel purpose and happiness when you're of service to others. How many people have felt good about when someone said, you helped me? That's altruism, right? That's altruism, right? So an altruistic leader is simply a servant leader, someone that serves others, that people will follow you, but in your service, you're not getting paid or whatever. You're doing it to serve, to uplift. You know? and, and we have civil rights leader, brother, Dr. Martin Luther King right here. He's right here. Uh, that's a, just a great example of servant leadership, altruistic leadership. Now, how is kindness embedded in all of these? Well, I'm going to go down each style and tell you how kindness is embedded in all these things, right? So kindness, we want to have the um, uh, innate, we want to make sure that people are safe. I believe at the bare m minimum, that is a kind act, right? That's I want to make sure that you're good. So even in this do as I say and not told as a parent, it's embedded in kindness, right? They're doing it to be kind, they're doing it to make sure you're safe. Uh, authoritative leader. Now you'll say to the military, how is that military? Well, ideally, follow my orders no matter what, we will survive these terrible situations. So in that one, it's still a protective, right? Coming from that mindset of protecting people. Innovative, usually when you have creative ideas, you want to solicit. So we'll go later on about being able to have the openness to receive feedback. So you're open to ideas and sharing. You value other people's ideas. Pace setting, as I said earlier, you don't want to burn people out. You want to make sure that people are good as they do and be productive. So when you set the pace, you're feeling for what they're going through. Democratic, knowing that my voice serves others, like I'm not just speaking on my behalf, I'm speaking on the people that voted me in. Uh, with the affiliation, right, I'm assuming with this one, I'm only going to affiliate or be a part of an organization that matches my values. Coaching, Dean Smith, building up leaders, developing other people, and very easy to understand, altruism, service to others. So I like this graphic when we go to leadership, right? What people think leadership looks like, it is not just telling people what to do, but look at all these different things, right? And you can see some of these things, if you look at it really closely, right, you can see kindness, right? Uh, praising people, listening first, and having empathy. So embed it in there, in that, in that core principle of different styles of leadership and what you actually do as a leader, there's kindness. So I just want you to think about these questions as you reflect, you know, in, in, in my normal sessions, we would have opportunity to, to break out, but I want to kind of get through this. But just think about which leadership style resonates with you the most, which one is, you know, the one that you, you, you think of like that matches me now that you've gone through this. Right. As I shared those stories of my father and my grandfather, now I understand which one uh, aligns with me the most as an uh, who is an individual an example of someone that, you know, is a leader to you, someone that's a teacher, uh, a, a parent, uh, a family member, someone in the community, and why? Really dive in. Why are you drawn? Why would you call them good? What values do they have? What actions do they do? And then lastly, what are some myths? I just want you to kind of brainstorm because we're going to go to it next. What are some of the myths that you have around kindness, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and go to it. How many people have heard of some of these things? If you're kind, people will take advantage of me or take advantage of you, right? You know, nice, we have a lot of quotes for that, right? Nice guys finish last, right? We have all these different things. And, you know, you think about it. But I would like to reframe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the myth, and then I'm going to dispel that myth for you right now. If you're kind, people will take advantage of you. No, kindness does not equal weakness, right? You can still be firm. You still can hold people accountable, but you don't have to be a pushover. One example of this, about not letting people take advantage of you, is that I used to have a supervisor, right? And I would show up late, right? Show up late to work, show up to late to meetings, you know. Uh, it's probably still do. But that's not the, the main story, is that that supervisor pulled me aside. And being a kind leader, she did not berate me. She did not act condescending. She didn't yell at me. She said this way. This is how she reframed it, by not being taken advantage of. Philip. I don't want others to think negatively of you in rooms when you come in late. So I think it'd be best if you come on time because not for me, 
I want them to see that you're hardworking and dedicated. So the way she was reframing it was she did correct the negative behavior of me showing up late, but she did it with grace, right? So kind leaders can hold people accountable. You know, don't do this, don't do that, but they can reframe it in why or what's the impact, all right? Kind people don't push back when others ignore them or late or fail to do as they're committed, right? Same thing kind of aligned, right? You're setting a standard, right? Kind people don't ignore, right? They don't uh, appreciate being ignored. They are thoughtful and they speak with a tone in a way that respects boundaries, respects commitments, right? And just, just displays common courtesy. So kind of those align, right? They, they don't let people just ignore their, their leadership or ignore the things that they're doing or let people get away with things, right? They set boundaries. They set deadlines, you know? They might have to be firm. They're equitable, right? They're not gonna, they, because they, they know if they set a standard and someone is late with their assignments but someone is on time, you know, they might extend one grace, but then they'll say, okay, I have to set a boundary because this is not fair to those that are doing the right thing, right? Kind people are afraid to say no. How many of us are, are the yesers here? They say yes, take on too much, right? Okay, me, I'm gonna say me, right? <laughs> but you have to, you can say no, all right? But you can say no uh, with grace. One of my things, and we were talking earlier, one of our frat brothers says peace and blessings, right? But another way I've reframed it was pass the blessing. And what I mean by that, I'm saying no. It's, there's not a always automatic no. There's a maybe a not yet with some context. I can't do that right now. Or I'm uh, passing it on, passing the blessings. While I'm very happy about this opportunity, I can't commit. But I can tell you someone else that I refer you to that can do it, right? And I've done that on. And thinking about that, when you say no, but you put someone else on, you get two credits, right? You get credit for not leaving that person that asked you to do something hanging, and then you get credit for putting someone else to an opportunity. So think about that. Kind people do say no. They just say it differently. If you're kind, you can't make hard decisions. False. Sometimes you do make hard decisions when you're kind. Just with a, uh, a sense of kindness is that you're not scared to make t tough calls. You are just very empathetic to the impact of your tough decisions. And you have a style of translating that tough decision to people, right? How many people have made a tough decision and said, okay, but I made this decision, it's final, but here's the rationale and here's the impact. And I'm sorry, but just giving you context. So, you know, we've had uh, a lot of this going on with COVID. You know, I had a supervisor that had to make a hard decision to tell us to come back, right? And everyone's like, no, nah, go quit our job, right? And she was like, I know, but this is a university rule. They, the university wants us to come back, da, 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 da. I understand we can work, we can do a hybrid schedule, but this is a policy. This is a hard decision I had to make, right? And did some people quit? Yes. Did some people still leave? Yes. But she was transparent about the, the decision she had to make, right? So... That's another myth. Now, let's go back to the positive, right? Now we had to spell the myths. Here are some of the characteristics of a kind leader. And as I said earlier, this is where I'm gonna show you that it goes beyond the mushy mushy and the hugs and the feelings where it's really concrete things, right? Recognition. Kind leaders recognize the successes of others that go out of their way to do so. But here's the thing. They do it with consistency, recognizing people, and they do it uh, with equity, meaning I'm going to praise the good behaviors publicly of people uh, out loud, but I'm also going to do it to multiple people, right? I'm not going to do sort of favoritism, right? So, um, so and then frequency, right? Because how many times, if someone is not frequent with recognizing or giving you praise, what do you do? You're like, what you want? I'm like, you know, right? You're skeptical, right? It doesn't become, you know, how many times someone comes to you and say, I really, you know, Phil, I just want to say something nice. He's like, what you want from me? I do that with my kids. When they say, I love you, daddy, I'm like, what you want? You know, I start reaching for my wallet, right? But if it's consistent, I just, oh, okay, nice, right? So that consistency, it becomes part of your character, it becomes part of your leadership style, and it's not met with skepticism when it is consistent. Helping versus blaming. So this goes back to the boundary setting. There is a way that you can address uh, failures or setbacks without 
blaming or chastising people, right? So think about this same scenario. Someone shows up late all the time. Rather than saying, you're showing up late all the time, you know, da-da-da-da, I'm going to dock you. It could be like this. You're showing up late all the time. What's going on? Is there anything I can help you? Are you having issues with transportation? You know, what's going on at home? So you come from, from a mindset of instead of going to blame someone when they're doing something bad, you're thinking, how can I support you? What's going on? Uh, yeah, and then the likelihood, either the behavior will get corrected on their own, or you get an opportunity to say, okay, there's something that's going on that we need to help overall. So helping versus blaming. So before, when you're upset, when you're leading people or you're helping people or you're in the front, Instead of the first thing going to mindset is I'm going to tell them, give them a piece of my mind, really try to think, what's going on? How can I help this person? Or is there something going on that I'm not aware of, right? Calling out bad behavior. How many people have heard of teen cancers or people that bring the energy down, right? Well, a kind leader sets the tone and the morale of a group. They have, I really, for me, I think I ain't going to lie, toxic people is one of my biggest pet peeves, right? And I understand that toxic people are uh, one of my biggest pet peeves because not only does it affect me, but I can see that you can see the room, the room being sucked of energy. Right. So calling that out while it's discomfortable, you know, you're doing it for the greater good of the group. Right. Now, how do we do that? Do we call that toxic person out loud? You think that's the best strategy? Probably not. <laughs> probably not. So that's probably as a kind leader. Once again, pull them to the side, and come at them with an attitude of helping. And then the next one, too. What's going on? Why is this person toxic? Come to find out, most times, oh, they, you know, they were a victim of trauma, you know, or they had a bad boss, or they, you know, they got things going on, and they're just bringing that energy to the environment or to the team. So really, a kind leader understands that we need to make sure that we address that toxicity, but we also need to do it back to the other one with grace and style and kindness, right? Curiosity versus defensiveness. Now, this one is in re reaction to you receiving feedback. It's really, really hard. I ain't going to lie. When you are the leader, if things go well, the team gets credit. When things don't get well, uh, go well, you get blamed, right? And so... Think about that. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be questioned a lot. Uh, and it's very easy to get defensive and say, oh, I'm the leader. You know, how dare you? Or say things like, they don't understand. Um, you know, they're not in my shoes. Or you can go at it with the general, what we call, instead of being defensive and coming back at it, going at it with curiosity. How many times have you heard someone, they challenge a leader, and the leader's like, okay, cool. What would you do in this situation? And maybe, okay, that sounded, okay, that sounded very passive aggressive. How about this? All right, well, I'm curious, what would you do in that situation, right? The tone matters, right? But <laughs> coming at it with curiosity, right? Thinking about, okay, if they're coming at me, I always say, one of the greatest quotes I heard is, or someone else is saying, if someone's gonna come to me with a problem, then I would like them to also come to me with at least three solutions. So if someone came to me with a problem, I would ask them, what would you, you know, can you give me a couple options of what you would do in that situation? And then ask someone else, what would you do? So rather than being defensive, a leader that serves with kindness respects the opinions of others, welcomes the opinions of others, values the opinions of others, and then also at the end of the day, still makes decisions and said, yes, I heard option A, B, and C. I still went with this one, but I heard you, but I'm still doing it. And you take it. You just got to take it. That's the burden of leadership. And then lastly, finding common ground. Um, I think this one, win-win, um, right? You're kind of doing the, the greatest for the good, right? But also I think about uh, the ones that are the kind of like the culture, not just the pace setters, but the culture setters, right? We, as a collective, set a common ground. I encourage you, every time you start something or you lead something or you, you, know, you organize a group, you take the first meeting to say, how do we act as a group, you know? It can be even down to things like, do we raise hands before someone talks, right? Or what do we do when we have a problem? You set the tone early on about the culture of the group that you develop. You know, how do we treat people, right? That's a kind leader. How, if someone has a problem, do we call them, like, 
So you said that we have common growth. What is what do we all want to accomplish? Right. I want to hear everyone's voice when you do that. That's setting common ground. Some more consistent encouragement. Uh, we literally speak uh, the words that we want, they want to hear, but we do it over and over again. So going back to that recognition, recognition is frequent, frequent and public. And it's also just encouraging, like uh, encouragement while you're doing it, right? So what I mean by that, encouraging, like while we're going through the process, while we're going through the trials and tribulations, I'm consistently encouraging that we're getting there. We're doing well. I'm, you know, touching base. You know, this is the goals. This is why we're doing it. The cheerleader, the cheerleader in all of us, Everyone likes that, right? Uh, I'll be honest. And some people uh, have to actually make a concrete effort, right? So we have people in our team that are natural cheerleaders. It just comes natural. And there's those that need to work on it. I say for those that need to work on it, just think about like set a schedule or something like you have to kind of be systemic with how do I uplift people? How many people have heard of the word uh, clear as kind? I don't know, Brene Brown, I don't know, whatever. TED Talk, but clear as kind, meaning clarity. You know, when people feel, when I hear from leaders and they're transparent and they're telling me, you know, as it is, whether it's good, bad, and ugly, that makes me feel good. Think about this. If you know what's going on, it lowers your anxiety. It lowers the fear and worry of the unknown, right? Like you say, I'd rather someone say, hey, we're about to do this project and it's going to suck. <laughs> like, I'm just going to let you know right now, it's going to be a terrible situation. It's going to be hard or it's going to be very laborious or it's going to be like this. And I'm just going to let you know up front, this is what we're going to expect. But while we're doing it, we're together. We're doing it as goals. We're going to do it one step at a time. We're going to chip away at it, right? Rather than like having, being blindsided about how tough things are. Going back to that COVID situation, right? <laughs> we knew it's, like, it's going to be a tough, rough couple of months. Uh, she was like, this semester is going to be hard. I encourage you to take care of yourself. I encourage you to take days off, like things like that. But she told us straight up, this is going to be hard. I appreciate you. Thank you for telling me. Um, respect, that's going without saying. Everyone wants to be respected, open to new ideas. But I think the main thing about uh, respect is it's equitable. It's, it's fair and it's across the board. You know, It's basically setting boundaries that I would treat you the same as I would treat you, as I would treat you, as I would treat you. I respect. And then in inverse, I would expect you to treat everyone else the same as well, right? So this part, this is kind of one of my favorite, right? Not favorite, like a great thing, but the thing that means the deepest to me, right? Kind, kind leaders are aware of their own biases and their own prejudices, and, their, and they, try to, they, have to, they really try to minimize that. This kind of, when I say this is one of the ones that had the most impact on me, is we had this whole um, rise in diversity, equity, and inclusion, thinking about treating people and thinking, we have to take a step and think about where do we have pre-existing or implicit biases and think about, you know, slowing down, right? And I think one of those things I think about that, right, is similar to life situations, right? Like having empathy uh, rather than immediately going to someone and saying, uh, a bias that I have is late is bad, right? I mean, not now, but like someone say that late is bad rather than an impl implicit like, you know, professionalism and equal in that everyone has the same view of professionalism, more so like late, probably not a good look, but what's going on? What, what is this person going? What's what it, lowering my biases of that pre-assumption of dress code, right? Or, you know, um, like uh, pre-existing biases, right? If you have a lot of tattoos, right, then you're not smart, right? I'm just, and I'm just, these are biases, but then you're thinking about pre-existing, like, let me understand that biases, that's something I need to be aware of. I'm not going, that, that's not true, right? And I need to be kind to this gentleman or not assume that someone has a lot of tattoos, X, Y, and Z. So uh, being kind helps you think about that. I need to minimize the impact of my biases in the way I treat others. Feedback, once again, um, oh, Feedback for others. So that one was about receiving it. Feedback for others. The key word there, and I love the word when you break down words, right, and you think about the root meaning, constructive feedback, right? It is not destructive feedback. What do I mean by that? Construct. Construct. Construct means build. So therefore, 
this feedback that I give construct should build up, not tear down, right? So think about that. I love using late. I guess it must be like I'm always late and whatever. But think about that situation again, right? The same situation, same situation, right? How can I provide feedback that rather is condescending, blaming, ripping someone down, tearing them down? How can I provide feedback to build them up to be better, to do better, right? And so you're going to still provide feedback. You have to. A leader, as a leader, you have to provide feedback, but you can't do it in a way that tears people down. And then lastly, I think, I think this is my last one, is um, connect with others, right? You're trying to proactively seek the opinions of others, right? You're building trust. Trust is innate in there, right? You're building connection. You're building community. The connection piece of connecting people. As a leader, you do not want people to feel siloed or isolated. Uh, studies have shown that since COVID, there has been a rise in loneliness. Just read the feeling, the feeling of loneliness. Does anyone know the difference between being alone and loneliness? Yeah, what do you think? What's that? Oh, yeah, cool. I'm sorry, I forgot. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll get to y'all later because I forgot. I got to, oh, I'm going to talk. Okay, well, then, what's the difference? Okay, well, I'm going to say it. It's good. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Being alone means you're actually by yourself. Loneliness yeah. means you could be surrounded by people, but you still feel like you're by I yourself. love it. Thank you, right? Uh, alone is the actual spatial component. You are not surrounded by anyone. Loneliness is a feeling, and as this young lady said, you literally could be in a crowded room and still have the feeling that not feeling connected to other people, right? And so there's a difference, right? Um, or, this is weird, right? In the inverse, you can be physically by yourself, but feel connected to something bigger than yourself, or still feel, con you know, there's a thing that's like, do you, you know, while you're physically alone, could you pick up the phone and always call someone? I'm not lonely then, right? I may be alone, but I'm not lonely. And so a leader, thinking about that, builds connections. They really try to do things through their acts of kindness and service to others. They are really trying to eliminate the feelings of loneliness amongst others, right? Whether it's a common cause, a common good, a common standard, a common community, is that you're really working on connecting others, right? Um, I hate that. I'm one of those people that, like, if you were by yourself at a party, I'd, like, walk over and, say, you know, say, come on over here. I'll introduce you to some people, right? You know, you, you take, you lean into your, your personality. So I'm an extrovert, so I can't, you know, I can't help it, right? Or if that person's like, yo, I am over here for a reason. I don't want to go to the greater group. I stay over there and talk to that person, right? Until they say, yo, I'm annoyed, go away. And I'm like, all right, bet, I got the, you know, I get the message. But, you know, it's just my sister's in me, right? I want people to feel connected. And, and that's what kind leaders do. So for academic success, how does kindness work, right? So academic success, think about this in your mindset is uh, one, helping others in your class, maybe you know, um, like raising other people up. If you have a subject that you're better at than others, right? Offering to support them, you know, you know, just reach around, tutor, don't just straight up give them your homework, but whatever, you know what I'm saying, like help them. Or think about academic success uh, in a sense of the group projects and things like that, right? As I said earlier, set that tone early. Um, I'm the type of person that if you're kind, you know, you're kind, a lot of people come to you, right? If you're that person in class that always tears other people down, then no one's going to help you. But if you're the cool person that's cool with everybody, they're going to help you. Like, random people help you. You know, think about that. Like, hey, man, Phil, like, you know, or like every time I would speak in class, instead of saying, oh, that person's wrong, I say, I would try to say something like, I kind of agree with what they said, but, you're right? So publicly, I wouldn't make embarrassing people, right? And then they come out to class and they say, oh, yeah, that, you know. So even as you carry yourself in academic spaces, if you're kind, this, this, is, this is not rocket science, you'll get help. <laughs> like, you know, teachers will help you more if you're nicer to your teachers, fellow classmates. People would actually think they would like to be around you, right? Your teams, your clubs, and your organizations. I went through all those previous examples, right? Think about this. You do not need to be the coach of a team to be a leader, right? You could be a leader in your own lane, your, in your own position, uh, and, and laterally, and help each other, right? Or if you are the captain, you lead a captain that brings the whole thing. Uh, what's that phrase? Uh, a rising tide rises all boats, right? So yeah, if this person's lacking, we need to rise each other all up. We all look good. 
I used to always just say, if he look good, we all look good. We all shine, right? There's enough for us all to shine. And then for some people in your job, how many people got like a part-time job and, and all that? Good, make money. Kindness, kindness will, without going said, whether you're directed up or whatever, is going to put you on. You're going to be, if you're kind up, people will refer you and say, that's the, you know, you always got a reference. If you're kind as a supervisee, people are always going to, they're going to um, bring new people. So one of the things I think about is like, as a leader, usually when you're a kind leader, what happens is people sing your praises in rooms that you're not in and they refer you. Hey, you want to work? You should work for him. And not saying you should work for him because he's a pushover. You don't want that one, right? You don't, want, you don't want everyone to come to you because they know that you can get away with stuff. But they're like, hey, you should work for Phil because when you work for him, he gives you credit. When you work for Phil, when you work for Phil, he doesn't come at you sideways. He, he helps you or he gives you resources, right? So kindness really embeds in your academic life, your uh, you know, your leadership within organizations and professionally, right? And so I would say this commitment, you know, you don't have to like raise your hand, I solemnly swear, but think about this. <laughs> I will lead with compassion, right? That's that nice, with grace. Grace relates to your tone. With empathy, meaning I will try to understand the feelings of others. Honesty, I keep it real, I'm transparent, I'm clear, and patience. And when I got these kids, that's probably the hardest one, yeah, you know, being patient. But all these other ones um, make sense. And so I'm going to challenge you, too, you know, think about this today, tomorrow. Um, send a nice text to someone. Try it right now, honestly. Get your phone out. Take a moment. Say something. If it's work, whatever, just say, Pick someone, I, you know, you can do an activity, scroll, like I call it, scroll to the bottom, bottom four, scroll to the bottom of your text and the last person you text, just say something out of the blue, but say something, hey, say something, hey, just want to reach out to you, I'm proud of you, but this is the part where I have to say it, do something that is uniquely about that person, not generic, not copy and paste, something unique, and I bet you, I'm going to wait, after this, we'll, we'll touch base on the Q&A part. I bet you some of you are going to get some responses like, what you want? Why are you doing this? And all this. But I will tell you right now, that it, it makes someone else. Or this other one, too. Someone that you know is going through a hard time. Hey, just thought about you today. I know it's hard, but I'm here to support you. I got your back. Things like that. It's an activity. Uh, really, this, uh, in this example, the example here is that all those things that I shared does not take monumental effort. It doesn't take money. We're doing it already. Y'all's already on your phone already. <laughs> might as well. If you're already on your phone, might as well do something to help someone else, right? You're already doom scrolling. Do something <laughs> like, if you're already going to doom scroll on your text, do something at least in there to help someone else out, right? All right, so we're going to save the questions for end. And then I'm gonna, we're going to bring these up to later. But I wanted to say some real qu quick thing, um, a story, right? I'll finish off with this story. So there is a teacher. Oh, this is one of my favorite stories. There is a teacher and there's a student, right? And so uh, the student, how many, how many of y'all seen the movie Moana? All right, I watched it during the pandemic. I think I got your welcome recycled on my head. My, I got a five-year-old and eight-year-old, and I'm like, please, why we have to watch this over again? But point is, that is actually based in reality. There was, in Polynesian culture, there were people that would go from island to island to island. Um, you know, island hoppers or journey people. Um, and what's mainly remarkable about it is that they were doing that treacherous journey on tiny boats, like the movie Wana, with only sails, right? There was no oar. Well, they had oars, but they didn't have any motorized boats, really crazy maritime stuff. I don't think they even had compasses, right? They were using the stars and using you know, thinking about where am I in relation to certain things in the sky, right? So think about this scenario, going from island to island. There's a teacher and there's a student. And so this student was going out there and getting ready, kind of like Moana, and, you know, spearing fish, building up her sail and doing all these different things, and would come back to the teacher and say, hey, teacher, I'm ready. I'm ready to go on this journey. You see me getting ready. And it's very similar to that character. They're like, no, you can't go. It's dangerous. Pulled her back, right? Get frustrated how many times that happened, right? Go back out there. 
Start doing it again, tying knots, doing all this stuff, right? Comes back. Okay, you see me going further out? I'm ready to go, right? All right, the teacher says, all right, where's Tahiti? What? Why are you asking me where Tahiti is? You're not ready yet. So she goes back, comes back again, doing it again. So you see me getting ready. And then the teacher, same story, push the brush her off, only ask one question, where's Tahiti? I don't know, I've never been to Tahiti. Last time, goes out there, frustrated, grumbling. How many times we go out there, we're just grumbling, like, oh, you know, I'm gonna do this anyway, you know, forget y'all. Come back, says to the teacher, says to the teacher, I'm going out regardless. I'm going out to sea. I'm going on this journey. Uh, I've been practicing, I've been training. Uh, I even have dreams about this. Ah, you have dreams. Dreams, interesting. So where is Tahiti? And the student said, it's in my mind. And then the teacher said, okay, you're ready for that journey, right? And so think about that. Why would I bring up a story about visualization, right? Well, in this capacity, with this style of leadership, there was kindness in two aspects of that, right? The kindness in that part was that the teacher was not automatically saying no to that person going on their journey. The teacher was doing what was uh, in the best interest and in making sure that the person was prepared and knew what they were getting into, right? And so in that aspect, when you think about that and it wasn't a no, um, it's not really a no, it's a not yet. And pulling something out of you, if you're leading other people, you're building up, you're preparing them, right? And for that person, the kindness thing, which was say in my mind, I'd like to say even further in that journey or in that story, when you go out and do things, understand that while you go to places and things that you've never done before and you have the vision of things that you want to do, the one thing I want to impart on you is that as you go on these journeys, right, that you do it with the mindset of bringing other people with you, that kindness is embedded in your journey, right? That as I go to my Tahiti, whatever goals you want to accomplish, I'm not going to go in there like a, a bull in a china shop and be destructive and rip everyone apart in my way to go on this journey, right? Um, you know, I have dreams, I have a, a destination, I have goals that I have, but nowhere in my goals or in my vision will I sacrifice kindness. So I want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, we're going to be around, we're going to shift, have a break. Um, but thank you so much for taking your time. Um, just the fact that you listened to me uh, gave me a lot of joy. I could see myself in you. I was a Jack and Jill kid. And I was like, well, maybe down the line, you'll be on the other side presenting and bringing up other people just like I was opportunity, had the opportunity to do today. So thank you so much. I appreciate it.